Hi everyone, thank you very much for joining me today to talk about wearable technology in clinical trials. You might be wondering, what could I possibly have to talk about with regards to wearable tech that's actually new? Um, the topic has been sort of talked to death in a few different areas, and what I want to do is, instead of just talking about what's available and what can you do with it, is talk about how to take the right type of wearable tech integrate it into your trials and get the best possible outcome measures that are relevant to your study. So first before I go any further, I just want to introduce myself really quickly. My name is Maureen Phillips. I work for Great Lakes Neurotechnologies and I've been with the company for several years working with external sponsor companies to integrate wearable technology into their clinical trials. So that's what I'll be focusing on today. As I mentioned, wearable tech is everywhere. It is on your wrist, it's in your pocket, it is on apps, it is all over the place and there's so much available that how would you even know where to start or what to do if you were thinking about integrating this into a clinical study? So that's why I'm here to kind of help guide you through that process. With regards to wearables, there are finger sensors, there are phones in your pocket, there are wearable biosensors, there are apps, there are wrist-worn medical devices, there are harnesses and sensors that you can place all over the body, there are your direct consumer wearables. There is so much to navigate through, so how could you possibly have all the information to make the best decision? One interesting fact is that the wearable technology market actually reached $2 billion at the end of 2015. That is massive. And what's even more interesting is that that market is expected to increase to $5 billion by the end of 2019. So think about all of those devices and gadgets that you see out and available right now and more than double that. It's just going to continue to grow. In addition to wearable devices, you also have M Health apps. In fact, at the end of 2013, there were more than 93,000 M Health apps available for download by consumers, patients, doctors. So it is a big web of devices and apps to try to work your way through when you're thinking about integrating these into a clinical trial. And what I want to do is talk to you today about the best decisions that you can make to make for a successful study. The first thing to mention, I think, is the benefit that wearables are having on clinical trials. There is so much good and so much information that can be gained from wearable devices and apps that was never available to us before. So not only are you collecting additional information, but you're also doing things like increasing patient engagement. You're also increasing accessibility to patients who maybe wouldn't have been able to participate in a clinical trial in the past. So there's a lot of positive reinforcement surrounding wearables, but there's also things to, be uh, to look out for as well. And what I think is important is to look at where the wearables market has gone in the past with regards to clinical studies and try to learn from some of those past experiences or perhaps mistakes. The first experience I wanna talk about is a study that Biogen did with Fitbit where they monitored MS patients and they wanted to track activity throughout the course of a clinical study. What they found at the end of the study was that the Fitbit just did not have sophisticated enough sensors to detect the symptoms of MS accurately. So the question comes into play, why was the Fitbit used when it really isn't validated for MS? Another thing that you may have heard of recently is how the Fitbit has come under fire with regards to the accuracy of the heart rate monitor. So there's been studies that have shown that it's not nearly as accurate as Fitbit claims it to be. So that just goes back to that same resonating point on validation. Was the heart rate monitor actually validated? How about their sleep monitoring capabilities? Is that a validated feature of the Fitbit? And I'm not here to bash Fitbit, I'm not here to say what's valid and what isn't. I just wanted to bring up a couple of points to sort of pave the way for the rest of the conversation and get you thinking about a few things that have happened in the past so that we can make the right decisions moving forward. So what I actually want to go through and talk about today is first, why are you thinking about wearables? And from our experience, what's the information that we've gotten from customers about why they're integrating wearables into their study? In addition to that, I want to talk about some wearable technology that's currently available on the market specific to Parkinson's disease. 
and then also give you some information on what to look for in a wearable device and what are the right questions to ask to make sure that you're getting exactly what you need to be the best fit for your clinical study. Finally, I want to talk about tips for integrating wearables into your protocol based on our experience as a company in running internal clinical studies and also working with external sponsors. The first point that I'll cover is why Parkinson? So I said I wanted to talk about some wearable tech that's on the market for PD and why are we choosing to focus on this area? Well, as a company, Great Lakes Neurotechnologies focuses on the manufacture and sale of devices for wearable, or I'm sorry, for Parkinson's symptom monitoring. Um, we specialize in wearable sensors and apps and cloud storage. But in addition to that, I think Parkinson's is a really relevant topic. You hear a lot about it in the news of different companies who are claiming that just wearable acti activity mon monitors can be used for assessing Parkinson's symptoms. Or you can use a phone for assessing Parkinson's symptoms just by using a standard accelerometer. So it's really a timely and relevant topic, not just because of what we do as a company, but because of what's going on in the wearables and Parkinson's market right now. So why are you thinking about integrating wearables into your trial? There's probably a lot of reasons, and you know we've heard tons of them over the years, and I sort of narrowed it down into the top three that we hear over and over again from our customers. And the first one is the desire to add objective monitoring to a clinical trial. So many times in Parkinson's trials, the outcome measures used are subjective in nature, which creates issues with reliability and uh, sensitivity of data. So when you integrate an objective sensor or electronic data capture, you're, per, you're adding a, an objective and a quantitative measure that's highly sensitive, that's repeatable, that's something that you haven't used in the past before. So it's giving you a better piece of information than using just the standard subjective way of assessing symptoms in Parkinson's trials previously. In addition to the objective measurement, data accessibility is really a big component of using wearables and apps nowadays. So when it comes to apps, think about the way that we were capturing data previously, pencil and paper, but now what we can do is capture that data electronically, have it all stored in the cloud somewhere so that we can access that information at any point in time during the study so that relevant information can be obtained when it's needed and we don't have to wait to be receiving reports or wait for transcribing of information. The final point is subject engagement. I think this is a really key point when it comes to integrating a wearable into a clinical trial because it's not it shouldn't be seen as a burden. It should be seen as a way to increase engagement from your participants. Subjects are really interested in new technology and understanding how to use apps and sensors and all of these new features that come along with them. In fact, going back to that Biogen study that I mentioned earlier, one really interesting point about that was that within the first 24 hours of that study opening, they enrolled 248 patients within 24 hours. So adding a wearable could really increase the attractiveness of a clinical trial for a potential participant. The next thing that I want to talk about are technologies that are available on the market for objective monitoring. And I mentioned Parkinson's disease specifically. So going into some detail about what is used in Parkinson's trials currently, I think is going to um, set the stage for talking about the devices that can be used. So when it comes to Parkinson's disease and clinical trials, a very common outcome measure that's used is the Unified Parkinson's Disease Rating Scale, or UPDRS. The UPDRS is a subjective clinician-administered scale that, in which clinicians assess patient symptom severity and provide a, scale, a score on a scale from zero to four that correlates to severity. So zero would be the absence of symptoms and four would be the most severe. There are a lot of issues when it comes to using the UPDRS as an outcome measure because of intra and inter rater reliability issues, as well as just the subjective nature of using the UPDRS in general. In addition, the UPDRS can only really be administered in the clinic, so you're missing out on some additional information that might be captured from a patient's home. So that's where Kinesia 1 comes into play. 
Kinesia One is a task-based motor assessment system that integrates a wearable sensor, an app that's installed on an iPad, and cloud storage as a complete package for measuring Parkinson's symptom severity. Patients wear the sensor on different areas of the body, depending on the symptom that you're assessing, and zero to four severity scores are calculated for each symptom that correlate to current rating scales. So with Kinesia 1, you have the ability of objectively measuring tremor, bradykinesia, dyskinesia, gait features, all of these different symptoms that were typically just done with the UPDRS, but now you're getting a highly sensitive and objective outcome measure in addition to just your standard clinician ratings. To go into a little bit more detail about the data that we provide with Kinesia 1, this is an example of a report of a patient who performed Kinesia 1 motor tasks over the course of an entire day. On the x-axis is the symptom that's being assessed and on the y-axis is time. And what we do is we actually color code each symptom severity score to correspond with the rating, where red or four would be the most severe and green or zero would be the least severe. And what this does is it provides a very quick and easy visual interpretation of symptom response to different treatments, as you can see in the example here. In addition to the UPDRS, which is your clinician reported outcome measure, there's also patient reported outcome measures that are commonly used in Parkinson's trials. One of the most common is the paper diary, and it is literally a piece of paper that's given to patients where they are instructed on certain days to rate um, the occurrence of symptoms as well as the occurrence of side effects over every 30 minute period. So they're instructed on what to do, rate themselves using this paper diary, and then they bring the diary back to the clinic for interpretation and transcribing. Now you can probably just imagine all of the difficulties that are associated with using this format. One being patient recall. How do you know that the patient was accurately remembering what was going on with their symptoms at a certain period of time? Especially if patients aren't doing it in real time, they're doing it after the fact. There's also the issues of patients just not completing the diaries in general and perhaps doing them sitting in the parking lot before they go in for their clinic visit. When you have a drug that's being approved to market based on this as an outcome measure, I think the addition of an objective sensor is really needed here because that's what's going to provide sensitivity and reliability to the data that you're getting. Kinesia 360 is the objective correlate to the patient reported diary. With Kinesia 360, we use two motion sensors, one that's worn on the wrist and one that's worn on the ankle of the patient while they go about their day just as they normally would. Different from Kinesia 1, patients don't need to complete specific tasks or perform certain things at different times during the day. Instead, they're just acting as they normally would, but while wearing sensors. In addition to sensors, we also have patient-reported outcomes available electronically within the app if you still wanted to integrate that as an outcome measure in your trial. Ultimately, though, what you're getting is objective symptom information from two motion sensors that have been proven through scientific validation to distinguish Parkinson's symptoms from activities that, they, that may mask or mimic those symptoms. So with Kinesia 360, you're getting a complete picture of what's going on with a patient all throughout a day or several days in a row in an objective and sensitive manner rather than just relying only on that patient-reported diary. With the Kinesia 360 data, we break things down into two minute intervals over the course of wear time. And for each two minute interval, we detect whether or not tremor or dyskinesia was occurring. And then we also calculate mobility measures. Instead of looking at things in just this two minute resolution view, we also then summarize the information for you so that you can see how much of the day did this patient spend experiencing tremor and at what level of severity. We do the same for dyskinesia in calculating what percentage of the day was this patient on with or without dyskinesia. We also calculate mobility measures such as percent time of the day a patient was active versus inactive. Was it gait activity or non-gait activity? If the subjects were using the electronic patient reported outcomes, we also summarize that diary information as well. So these are two systems that we have commercially available for Parkinson's assessment 
ready to go and have been integrated into clinical trials globally to this point. So now that you have a few examples of what's available, what are the types of questions that you need to ask us or other organizations if you're considering implementing wearables into your clinical trial? And going back to one of my very first points and what might be one of the more important take home messages from this talk is validation. Validation is critically important in understanding that the data you're getting from your device has been validated for that specific disease state or for your specific outcome measure. You can't just put a Fitbit on somebody and expect that it's going to provide valid results if it's not been validated for Parkinson's disease. The way that we've addressed validation with Kinesia is actually through 23 different clinical studies with sites all around the country where we validated the algorithms that are used for the zero to four severity scoring and detection of symptoms throughout the day. In addition to that, we validated the usability of Kinesia, which is just as important. You can have the best system in the world, but if patients aren't able to put on the sensors or interact with the app successfully, then you're not going to have successful integration into clinical trials or patient care applications. Finally, the validation focused on integration of Kinesia into specific therapy applications where we were either recommending patients for certain advanced therapies or screening patients for certain advanced therapies. So I don't want to go into tons of detail with regard to the validation. I'd be happy to share information with you after this on our publications um, or provide more information that way, but there are a few things that I do want to point out. The first is the validation for Kinesia 1, where we wanted to look at the reliability of using a wearable sensor as well as the sensitivity compared to your standard clinician outcome measure. So what we did was we had patients wear the Kinesia 1 sensor while they performed those same tasks that they would during a UPDRS assessment. Clinicians scored those tasks and the Kinesia device was also worn at the same time. What we found from that clinical study was that Kinesia was more consistent across symptoms such as tremor, bradykinesia, and dyskinesia, and more sensitive for those same symptoms than clinician scores. This is especially important when you're looking at things like test-retest reliability for an objective sensor, as well as if you're interested in integrating a wearable into a neuroprotective trial. If that's the situation, then you need something that's going to be able to detect very small, subtle changes in symptoms that may not be visible to the naked eye. When it comes to the validation of Kinesia 360, we took things a little bit in a, a different path. With Kinesia 360, patients are not performing very specific tasks. We don't know what they're doing at certain times during the day, so it presents new challenges. What we did with Kinesia 360 was we placed sensors on patients while they, perf while they went through a standard levodopa response cycle. And that's exactly what you're looking at on the screen here. Where the y-axis is symptom severity, the x-axis is time, the red dotted line represents dyskinesia, and the solid green line represents tremor. So just as you would expect, you have a patient who's experiencing moderate tremor severity. The dashed line represents when that patient took his medication, the tremor subsides, and then you get the occurrence of dyskinesia. So what's special about this plot is actually that this was all being detected while the patient was performing different daily activities that may mask or mimic symptoms. So in essence, we tried to trick the system into thinking that this patient was experiencing Parkinson's symptoms when really he or she was just performing activities that may look like those symptoms, including using a computer, dressing, grooming, eating, all of these different things that patients are going to do at home. So when you have a continuous passive monitoring system, this is a really important take home where you need to make sure that the system was intentionally tricked to try to elicit results for symptoms that really weren't there. That's exactly what we did with Kinesia 360. And this plot here is perfect proof that we were able to demonstrate that yes, we can differentiate symptoms from activities of daily living, and also distinguish symptom severity. So in addition to asking about validation, there's a couple other questions that you want to pose to potential vendors when you're thinking about integrating a wearable into your trial. 
So the next question is, what's your level of experience? Has this technology been integrated into clinical trials in the past? With regards to Kinesia, it's been used in several phase one, two, and four clinical studies as a primary and secondary outcome measure with hundreds of patients. What this results in is a significant amount of experience um, in integrating our technology into clinical trials and knowing the best way to position yourself as a wearable when you're looking at protocol development. Another big question that we get very regularly is, will this data be accepted by regulatory bodies, what, such as the FDA or in Europe? The answer to that is, as long as you have scientifically valid data, such as that with Kinesia 1 or Kinesia 360, then that's going to assist you in the process of getting this data accepted by regulatory bodies. In addition to that, you want to consider other factors, like is the equipment FDA Part 11 compliant with regards to electronic capture of patient data? That's another really big point. And you also want to ask, what is the data output? What are the measures that I'm actually going to be seeing from this wearable? And does that correspond with what I actually need to get in order for my trial to be successful? So those are a couple of questions to ask. I'm sure there's many more and probably some that you're thinking of, but in addition to that, you also want to make sure that you're setting yourself up for success with regards to integrating wearables into your protocol. So let's say now you've chosen which wearable device you'd like to use and you're ready to integrate this. So what are a few tips or suggestions that I have as to how this could actually seamlessly integrate instead of being something that's, oh, just one additional measure in a clinical trial? The first suggestion that I would make is choose the right device and choose the right outcome measures. The right device corresponds with the type of data that you need to collect. Are you looking at an outcome measure that correlates with the standard UPDRS, or are you looking to compare more with the clinician, or I'm sorry, the patient reported diaries? That's what's going to help you determine whether Kinesia 1 or Kinesia 360 is more applicable for your particular trial. In addition to that, understanding the exact outcome measures that you need is going to be really important when it comes to especially the data analysis component. Knowing whether or not you need zero to four severity scores, time spent in the on or off state, do you need actual raw motion data? Factoring all of this into your upfront planning is going to make for easier integration of a wearable into the trial down the road. The next thing to point out is sensor placement location. And that means a couple of different things, actually. The first is we get the question all the time, where do I put the sensor on the patient? Since for Kinesia 1 or Kinesia 360, it's one side of the body. And since Parkinson's disease is a unilater unilateral onset disease, uh, we recommend placing it on the more affected side so that you get the most accurate and relevant symptom information. However, in addition to just what side of the body do I put the sensor, you also want to think about where should I put the sensor to most accurately measure the symptom I need to capture. So if it's gait that you're looking at, the sensor should be placed somewhere on the lower extremity. If it's upper extremity tremor or bradykinesia, somewhere on the finger or the hand or the wrist is going to be most appropriate. You want to consider these things and also consider has the technology been validated for use in that specific body location. Measurement frequency and timing is another key point when you're talking about integrating a wearable into your actual schedule of assessments. So here we're talking about how often do you actually need to use the equipment in order to get the most usable information. If you're looking at doing an in-clinic trial where you need to measure a dose response, capture baseline data, then get your post-dose information at regular intervals. If you need to correlate to the patient reported diaries, record patients for at least two back-to-back -back days at home so that you're getting an average over the course of more than one day. This is a great point. Um, this is a question that we get asked very frequently about where is the most relevant place to plug this in. And we have a great biomedical engineering research team here at Great Lakes Neurotech that can actually assist with recommendations on how to integrate wearables into your protocol. In addition to that, we can also use our vast database of patient, of patient data to um, provide a power analysis when, you when you're trying to determine the best number of subjects to use for a clinical study. The 
next point to consider when you're thinking about adding the wearable into your protocol is patient compliance. You want to make sure that you're positioning the wearable to be successful at the beginning. Don't make this an extra burden and one more thing that a clinical site needs to deploy or one more thing that a patient has to do. Make this fit seamlessly into the clinical trial and make it understood that this is a very important outcome measure for the study. So instead of doing assessments at incredibly frequent intervals that might end up being burdensome to the patient, use um, use data that's available to help determine what the most um, or what the most necessary intervals might be. In addition to that, don't send patients home with a system like Kinesia 360 and request that they record data for three weeks. That might just end up in too end up with too much data and. Sorry, I lost my train of thought. You might end up with too much data in addition to adding to patient burden. So setting yourself up for success with regards to patient compliance is a really key point to consider. Finally, what I think is the most important take-home message that I've learned over the years is using proper screening techniques. And what I mean by that is Wearables shouldn't be just considered as an outcome measure in your clinical trial. They should also be considered a screening tool. When you're adding a wearable sensor, it can help so much in making sure that you're enrolling the right type of subjects in your study, more so than you might even think. If you have a drug that is set to reduce tremor severity in patients with Parkinson's, you better make sure that you're recruiting patients with a certain severity level of tremor. If you're not, then you're not going to see the results that you need. So add a wearable as a screening tool and as an outcome measure in your clinical study to give you, to set yourself up for the best success. So I hope what I've done today is employed you with information about wearables on the market, giving you the right types of questions to ask companies, whether it's us or somebody else, about validation, about prior experience, about FDA clearance, and giving you some tips and information on how to actually take these wearables then and integrate them into your protocol. I'd be happy to share any of this information with you over a phone call or by email or even share the slides, so feel free to contact me at any time. Thank you.